Vamos dar início a, a esta sessão do seminário, quarta sessão do seminário. É, inicialmente, dando as boas-vindas aos nossos convidados, aos quais queremos agradecer muito a, o apoio, a presença. E eu tenho um par de avisos, minimamente, aqui. Primeiro, é, nós sempre solicitamos a todos que tenham cuidado de falar no microfone quando expositores ou, ou, ou debatedores ou, ou pessoas formulando perguntas, porque está tudo sendo gravado e vai ter um tratamento posterior. Não é? É, nós teremos então a exposição do John Matthews, primeiramente, em seguida do Robert Wade, Aí haverá um intervalo rápido e chegaremos então à, à discussão com os dois debatedores que já estão aqui presentes. Eu vou apresentar as pessoas uma a uma à medida que a sessão se desenrole. Vamos conversar então, vamos começar então pelo John Matthews, que é um professor, professor, da Lewis University, de, em Roma. Ele tem uma cátedra da N sobre Economic Dynamics. E ele vai nos falar hoje, vai dar uma grande ênfase à problemática trazida pelas, pelas multinacionais chinesas, que estão é, é, tendo um comportamento que ele vai tentar sintetizar, caracterizar, etc. Sim? Yes? Okay, so thank you, thank you so much, uh, Antonio and uh, Adriano, for, uh, for putting on such a splendid conference. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to Ana Celia as well for being such uh, wonderful hosts and uh, providing the opportunity to discuss these fascinating questions. So this morning, as I, as I understand it, uh, Robert Wade will be talking about the global system Uh, and uh, the pressures and contradictions within that global system, my focus will be more on the rise of China and what other countries are doing about the rise of China. So I'm bringing you news from around the world, from industries where Brazil is not pe perhaps present as yet. Perhaps Brazil is not a player in some of the uh, industries that I'll talk about, and yet Brazil could be a player um, if it studied closely the kinds of strategies that Chinese firms and the China as a country uh, can be seen to be pursuing. So my title is China's Competitive Pressures and uh, the National and International Reactions to the China Challenge. So I'm really looking at how industries uh, evolve, the competitive dynamics within these industries and the impact that China and Chinese firms are having on these industries, both trying to enter the industries and once they have entered, uh, the impact that they have on other firms and countries. And the concept that I'll be using is technology leverage strategy. So, so the background is the books that I've been uh, publishing on the whole rise of the East Asian approach to industrial upgrading, Uh, first with the Tiger Technology book looking at uh, the rise of the semiconductor industry where China has become a dominant player just in the last 10 years uh, and then looking at internationalization strategies in the Dragon Multinational book which I'll be talking about this afternoon. But the uh, Tiger Technology book I'm pleased to say has now just appeared in Chinese translation. So this book was launched just last week Um, uh, at a ceremony at Qing Tsinghua University in Beijing. And uh, those characters reading across from left to right say, Ji Shu Cha Tong Zhan Lue, which means technology leverage strategy. And I'm hoping that uh, that will become a phrase that is widely used in China, but more, more importantly, should be a phrase widely used around the world in countries that want to be able to match the Chinese competitive challenge. So I'll spend a little bit of time explaining just what is meant by technology leverage strategy. So 
the, uh, the, the reactions uh, to the China challenge uh, that, uh, that Brazil is facing this competitive challenge, just as other uh, countries are facing the challenge. Uh, there's a Chinese tsunami uh, washing through Latin America, uh, to use the phrase uh, of, uh, of Antonio. And so uh, it's a very, very good to see a conference like this devoted to uh, trying to piece together uh, what are the elements of this uh, Asian tsunami? What are the strategies being pursued? What are the sources of competitive advantage? So Chinese firms are obviously highly competitive, but it's not just because of their low costs. It's also uh, because of the way that they can innovate around the cost structure, around their access to markets, around their use of technologies. So Chinese firms are able to capture what we can call latecomer advantages. And this is a, a strategy that has been developed first in Japan, then in Korea, then in Taiwan, to some extent in Singapore. And it's clear that China has learned from all of these prior examples and uh, is now applying the lessons very, uh, very ably, very uh, efficiently. So how do other firms in East Asia itself deal with the China challenge? And above all, how do Chinese firms strategize around the issue of entering new industries, uh, such as uh, the industries that I'll be talking about this morning? So to understand these issues is really to understand how to frame national competitive advantage in a Sinocentric era, a very graphic phrase that I've only learned coming here to Brazil, looking at the world as a Sinocentric system. Very, uh, very interesting phrase. So more specifically, we want to know then how uh, competitive advantages are constructed, how Chinese firms do this, and how they learn from the prior successes in Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, and to what extent will the strategies that they're pursuing work in these other countries? To what extent then are technology leverage strategies identifiable in the case of China, and then to what extent can we see them being generalized around the world uh, to uh, other countries, such as Brazil, looking to enter uh, into some of the knowledge intensive uh, industries at the moment. So where we can identify a dominant technology, that's where we see uh, the strength of this kind of strategy. So let me plunge straight into an industry where you see this very, very clearly. Uh, let's look at the flat panel display industry, where China has entered very recently, much to the discomfort of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. So let's look at the flat panel display industry. So you all know flat panel displays. They're, they're the displays on your computers, on your cell phones. This is an industry that only started back in 1990, but it's already uh, grown to be a huge industry. And looking at that chart, uh, we can see, first of all, the fluctuations in growth, but above all, we see that blue dominates that, uh, that growth. And blue is the dominant technology called amorphous silicon TFT LCD. So immediately we see there is a dominant technology in this industry. And that means that the industry is ripe for latecomer challenge by China. So uh, if we look at uh, how that uh, has been done, we see the, uh, the relative levels of investment and uh, Korea and Taiwan were dominating investment earlier. Taiwan now dominates investment in this industry, which is quite remarkable. Uh, but look at the rise of China, those red, uh, that red line at the bottom of the chart. And that spells China's entry into this industry. So the issue is, how has it done it? Okay. So the way it's done it is to focus very, very clearly on the industrial dynamics in this industry, which are cyclical dynamics. This is very, very characteristic of these knowledge-intensive industries. So here we see five or six uh, cyclical upturns and downturns. And the remarkable thing is that when you plot the entry by firms into this industry, you find that they cluster in successive downturns. So in the first downturn, Japanese, extra Japanese firms entered. In the second downturn, Korean firms. In the third downturn, Taiwanese firms. Then more Taiwanese firms. And in the fifth downturn, Chinese firms entered. So the Chinese firms we can see are reading the industrial dynamics extremely closely. And they're timing their investments to coincide with the upturns and downturns. And it's a very interesting question why it is that it's uh, successful entries occur during upturns, 
to, during, uh, sorry, during downturns and not during uh, upturns? That's a, that's a very interesting question that we could go into later if you wanted to. Uh, my, uh, my PhD student, Hao Tan, uh, has uh, uh, looked at uh, these industries and produced what uh, is probably the definitive account of the cyclical dynamics of uh, these industries, uh, and in particular the flat panel display industry. That's using quarterly data. That's a very, very accurate picture of the cycles. So um, what we find then with these industries is a remarkable process of industrial dynamics. Here we see the rapid turnover in the glass substrate, the process technology employed in producing flat panel displays, all the way from first generation at the beginning up to seventh generation. And now, if you, if you look at the industry now, they're up to the 10th and sometimes the 11th generation in less than two decades. So that's a remarkable turnover. But what it means from the perspective of the challenger, and China is still a challenger here, uh, what it means is that the incumbent firms are forced to reinvest every new process generation. They have to reinvest in their equipment, and that gives an opportunity to the latecomer to capture an advantage then, to be able to enter with the latest technology. So we see that uh, if we look at uh, this industry, we can actually plot uh, an analysis of it, uh, tracking the familiar five forces that are used in, uh, in strategy, but actually look at those five forces in a dynamic setting, looking at the change over time, the evolution of this industry over time. And uh, when I published an article on this uh, back in 2005, I made the prediction that Chinese firms would actually enter during the fifth downturn which was uh, against the prevailing view at that time. The prevailing view was that China would take a lot longer to learn the uh, technology of this industry. But indeed, Chinese firms did enter, joint venture firms uh, did indeed enter during that fifth downturn, much earlier than anticipated. So this was, in a sense, a justification of taking this perspective in terms of the cyclical dynamics. So. What, uh, what we're really talking about here is industrial upgrading, and uh, this is the sense in which innovation is understood uh, in China and in East Asia more generally. And this is a very important point, that I heard a lot of talk about innovation yesterday, and I quite understand why Brazilian firms have to become more innovative. I quite understand that. But in East Asia and in China, what they understand by innovation is firstly industrial upgrading. It's bringing, level, bringing the level of technology up to the world standard first. Then you can start to talk about maybe uh, diversifying and uh, moving in new directions that are new for the world. But the first uh, meaning of innovation is to bring your technology up to the standard that is prevailing. That's what catch up means. And catch up is very, very specific. And I'm going to show you how uh, these uh, firms were able to identify the catch-up goal quite specifically in quantitative terms and were able to plot their trajectory in terms of their capacity to catch up with a defined uh, quantitative uh, goal. So that's what innovation means. It means industrial upgrading. And we can use the two terms more or less synonymously in the case of these countries that understand uh, catch-up strategies and uh, latecomer strategies above all uh, the countries in East Asia. So and the interesting thing is that uh, in flat panel displays, when we look at the way in which uh, these countries have entered the industry, we see a quite distinctive pattern. In Korea, you see the repetitive use from one industry to another of the large firms called the Chaebol, like Samsung, like Hyundai, like LG. But in Taiwan, you see a characteristically different pattern you see a bunch of new firms entering each industry. In semiconductors, a group of new firms. In flat panel displays, a group of new firms. But they're frequently linked uh, through association, uh, through linkage to, uh, to other, uh, other, other firms. So they might be spin-offs, but they are fresh firms for the industry. And they're linked to uh, public research institutes, particularly Industrial Technology Research Institute, ITRI, in Taiwan. And then in Singapore, you see, a, again, a characteristic pattern of inviting in or attracting multinationals, uh, which established the industry in Taiwan. So the interesting hypothesis 
generated from these three patterns is that China is actually utilizing all three and simultaneously. And that would be a powerful driver of industrial upgrading if it were true. So my, the, the real focus of my presentation is to investigate to what extent that hypothesis is verified by the data. To what extent is China really utilizing strategies that it has learned from Korea, Taiwan and Singapore, looking at those as distinctive strategies. So that's the source, uh, if, if that were true, that would be the source of uh, the competitive pressure that is being posed by Chinese firms globally. That would be the, the source of the competitive pressure being felt by Brazilian firms, for example. So all of this uh, uh, needs to be set in, the, uh, in the, the, the broader setting of looking at the economy as a dynamic entity uh, with fast follower strategies. And this is another world, another conceptual and theoretical world from the world of neoclassical economics, which is static, which is all about comparative static uh, e equilibrium uh, analysis. And really, equilibrium analysis doesn't enter into this. You saw that dynamic a picture of that cyclical dynamics of that industry. That's a real industry, real companies are making uh, very, very large profits in that industry today. It's an industry that many countries would love to be players in. And uh, the analysis that the companies make of that industry uh, is, has nothing to do with uh, neoclassical economics. It has everything to do with analyzing the, uh, the dynamics, the upturns and the downturns, the pressures on the supply side, the pressures on the demand side. And uh, an emergent phenomena. So fast follower strategies uh, can be uh, viable when they can be attuned to the industrial dynamics. And uh, so we see then that, uh, that these uh, fast followers uh, in uh, Taiwan and Korea and, Ta and, uh, and uh, Singapore are able to build fast follower routines and that's what we see in the case of China today. So long as they're combined with the role of uh, public research institutes, providing uh, the knowledge that is then transferred across to the companies in the private sector. So let's look at some of the uh, patterns that we can see in these successful uh, industry uh, entry uh, experiences uh, to see to what extent they can be generalized and made use of by other countries because the whole burden of this analysis is to focus on what happened uh, in East Asia in the 1980s and 1990s with a view to seeing what might be happening around the rest of the world, particularly in China, India and Brazil in the 21st century. And when we look at the patterns uh, that have been successful, we see in uh, in entering the TFT LCD industry, apart from focusing on the fact that there was a dominant technology, but look at the difference in approach of these three countries. Japan was able to focus on TFT LCD technology to the extent of 62%. So there was a range of alternatives in the Japanese firm's approach. So it wasn't completely focused on the dominant technology. It was looking at a range of alternatives as well. Korea raised its focus to 80, what is it, 81%. Uh, so much more of a focus on the dominant technology. With Taiwan, the focus is almost entirely on the dominant technology. Now that is a powerful lesson. It shows you that if you want to be successful in these industries, you have to be able to identify the dominant technology and then focus on it. Some of the Taiwan firms are 100% TFT LCD firms, such as AU Optronics. They get very significant uh, latecomer advantages from that. All of their product design is one technology. All of the training of their engineers is one technology. So they get very significant cost advantages from that clear focus. Of course, the risk they run is that the industry will evolve and uh, that uh, it might move off that uh, dominant technology to another technology. But uh, these Taiwan firms are prepared to take that risk and uh, they would expect to be able to move uh, with as the industry evolves. So it's a risk they're prepared to run. Chinese firms are almost 100% focused on TFT LCD. 
The other interesting feature that one can see from the history of these industries is the extraordinary rapidity within which a value chain is created, an entire value chain. Now this value chain shows you what happened in Taiwan and it shows you what was created in less than a decade, less than 10 years. So if you read midway down the chart, you see AUO, Chime, CPT, Hanstar, etc. They're the main panel producing firms. And you see upstream, they're sourcing materials, components, right up to glass substrates. And one by one, uh, a process of industrial uh, strategy by, on the part of the country as a whole has found ways to replace imports from Japan in each of those categories and so uh, tai Taiwan has become independent on the supply side and then many many firms on the downstream side producing products that use the flat panel displays obviously most uh, significantly flat panel television sets color television high definition television so again, characteristic of uh, these latecomer strategies that we see in China, uh, exhibited here by the case of Taiwan, um, building the entire value chain as rapidly as possible in order to enhance national competitive advantage. So these patterns of uh, industrial upgrading, we can see repeated over and over again. We see the focus on dominant technology perhaps with the help of a public research institute, and I'll show you how that could be done uh, right later. Build up the value chain as fast as possible and keep your strategies linked very, very closely to the industrial dynamics, in this case, the cyclical industrial dynamics, the upturns and downturns of the industry. They are three lessons that we can see very, very clearly exhibited in this case of flat panel displays. So we want to know to what extent is that happening in China and to what extent is that uh, uh, being generalized across other industries? So let's look uh, very, very briefly then at another industry, the one that was established earlier, the flat panel, the, uh, the semiconductor industry or integrated circuits or what are known as chips. When we look at chips, we can see Korea, Taiwan, Singapore all breaking into this industry prior to China. So China again learning the lessons from these prior successes. In the case of Korea, uh, Samsung was the company that broke into this uh, industry back in 1985. And the vehicle for uh, Korea's entry were the large firms, the big Chaebol, the big integrated diversified firms. Uh, and uh, it was Samsung that did it first and then LG and Hyundai uh, closely following them. And it was based on their prior uh, market entry contracts. They were already well established as electronics producers. They were large uh, producers of electronics goods. They had uh, prior uh, original equipment manufacturing contractual links. So they weren't entirely bare. They weren't naked as they approached uh, this uh, industry, but they certainly didn't have the knowledge resources and the technology to produce chips. They had to acquire that and that's what their strategy turned on. Leveraging uh, knowledge uh, from companies in Silicon Valley, from companies in, in Japan. Uh, so they needed uh, a clear strategic goal of catch up uh, to guide this process. They m formed uh, multiple alliances, so each of the firms involved formed multiple alliances to leverage as much knowledge as possible. And this is the key to the catch up strategy that you find in these countries and now in China. Using the world as a repository of knowledge and finding ways to access that knowledge through various kinds of linkage, contractual linkage. And that's the key to what they're doing. So we look at a company like Samsung and we see how this company is changing its composition and its capabilities decade by decade. It's not a static entity. And uh, therefore, you know, the kind of comparative static analysis uh, that we see in neoclassical economics simply does not apply to these dynamic entities uh, like Samsung. And you can see how its uh, semiconductors uh, uh, capabilities were starting to increase rapidly towards uh, the 1990s. So what was the goal? It was, the goal was to catch up with the world frontier. And the world frontier in the case of chips is measured by the gap the gap between the lines on the circuits. So the closer and closer those lines can be drawn, the more transistors you can pack onto the chip. So the world frontier is coming down. Uh, 
be to one micron and below. But see how rapidly the Korean company is catching up. And by uh, the mid-1990s, uh, uh, it's already caught up with the world frontier. And indeed, Samsung uh, went on to become the world leader. But my point here is that there is a quantitative way of showing what the catch-up process involved. And that, of course, will be the case for any catch-up uh, strategy in the future, in the 21st century. Any catch-up strategy on the part of Brazil uh, or other uh, large countries in the 21st century will need to use the same kind of quantitative strategic catch-up uh, goal. Uh, Taiwan was a different case again. Again, a new crop of companies uh, like uh, sometimes affiliated with existing companies like ASA, but all closely involved uh, with the Public Research Institute, ITRI, the Industrial Technology Research Institute. So ITRI is able to attract foreign partners and uh, develop the technologies which are then passed across to the Taiwan firms through multiple R&D alliances. Now here's a good example of the kind of innovation that occurs. It, it was Taiwan that tested the architecture of different kinds of R&D alliances. And they tested ver uh, various models until they came up with one that they found worked. A few players, each having a, a financial stake in the outcome, and uh, rapidly formed and rapidly uh, dispersed, rapidly uh, dis disbanded. And they found that that was the, uh, a good architecture of an R&D alliance. So there's organizational innovation on the part of those firms. It's not just low labor costs, it's organizational and strategic innovation that helps to explain their success and of course that will also help to explain the success of any other country coming along like Brazil that wants to play this game as well. So again, had uh, firms, uh, numerous firms, many of these new to the industry like TSMC, the world's first semiconductor foundry, uh, and these firms form multiple alliances uh, with existing players in order to leverage that knowledge, linkage and leverage. They are the two key ideas that you see here that help to explain the success, together with some kind of uh, overarching guidance or piloting of the industry through state agencies, the role of the state, and uh, industry associations like the Taiwan Semiconductor Industry Association. Again, Taiwan has a very clear goal of catch-up, uh, the world frontier moving, moving ahead down to the, the micron level, uh, and uh, Taiwan firms starting way behind they bought their original technology to enter this industry from RCA in the United States. RCA was wanting to get out of semiconductors. They had seven micron technology when the world frontier was three microns. So that is kind of primitive technology. But that was enough to get Taiwan started. And then they rapidly caught up, as you can see. And again, by the mid-1990s, they're very, very close to the world frontier. So how did Taiwan firms enter? Well, they looked at the value chain of the industry globally and they examined that in terms of uh, where the, uh, what, which, which part of the value chain, starting with IC design and then uh, creating the masks and the wafers and then actually fabricating the chips and then testing and packaging the chips so that you can actually put those chips into electronic products. So where in the value chain would they want to enter? Any, any takers, where would you suggest that a country like Taiwan look to enter this value chain? Any suggestions? Well, when you look at the value that's being added, in fact, the least value added is added at the end of the chain in packaging and testing. So that's where the first firms were. They established themselves at the end of the value chain and then they move up the value chain against the flow of value. Value is being added along the chain. The Taiwan firms entered at the end and moved up the chain against that flow. And we can verify that by looking at the data. So this is the data for the 1990s. And we see at the, over at the left, uh, the dominant source of revenues is IC's packaging. And only a little bit is being added through design and manufacturing. But by the end of that decade, already uh, packaging is now a much smaller part of the revenue being generated and uh, IC fabrication is by far the most significant. 
So there's evidence of, uh, of a strategy, a strategy at work, moving into the value chain at a certain point and then moving along the value chain in order to cover the value chain as much as possible. Uh, and that was all being done in Taiwan in the 1990s and it's been done by China more recently as China becomes the dominant player in semiconductors. How did Singapore do it? Well, very, very rapidly. Singapore uh, was a very small uh, country by world standards, but uh, it found a way to invite in multinationals and use them as its source of building advantage, again, combined with, uh, uh, with uh, public research institutes like the Institute for Microelectronics, the IME, and using those institutions and the multinationals and putting, exerting state pressure on those multinationals to force them to uh, pass over technologies to build uh, more and more value-adding activities uh, in Singapore. Uh, using the pressure of the state to do that, uh, Singapore was able to build a strong export base using those multinationals. It's not just multinationals supplying the domestic market in Singapore, which was very small, but it's multinationals using Singapore as an export base, which of course uh, China has been doing uh, with very, very great success. So how is China uh, playing in the in integrated circuits field? It's now the dominant player. More than 50% of the world's semiconductors are now produced in China. And again, we can see how China has followed uh, three different models to enter this industry using large firms, that is state-owned enterprises, which are able to go out into the world on their own and find technologies and license technologies. Uh, but a different model of uh, small firms that are linked with uh, uh, public research institutes. China has an abundance of scientific research institutes all linked in one way or another with the uh, Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences and, uh, and of course the open door policy for multinationals. So you can see that what helps to explain the dynamism of China's entry into industries is that they're using these three patterns of industry entry. They're walking on three legs as it were. So we see the repetition in flat panel displays that shows you the major countries involved in flat panel displays, all of them again notably coming from East Asia. Yep. And uh, again a similar kind of pattern with the large firms uh, in Korea with smaller firms or fresh to the industry uh, in Taiwan linked with the uh, with linked with the in ITRI, the Industrial Technology Research Institute. In this case ITRI had patents uh, which they, pa they pooled, formed a patent pool and passed that across to all six companies that entered the industry in Taiwan. A characteristic way for the state uh, R&D unit to support the entry of the industry. And uh, then of course multinational linkage, uh, t Singapore again uh, following that, uh, that practice uh, in uh, the company called Advanced Flat Panel Display. So again, a strong pattern of uh, national innovation systems with China employing all three. I'd just like to show you one final example because this is a current technology in a current industry. And uh, this is data that I've just collected in Taiwan very, very recently. And this is uh, the photovoltaic industry. This is a renewable energy industry. And this is one that uh, I think almost everybody in this room would want to see Brazil be a player in this industry. Brazil is already uh, establishing a very, very strong position in renewable energies. So this is a renewable energy that Brazil should be a player in. So let's look at how uh, Taiwan and China are becoming players in this very, very significant industry. When you look at that data, you can see that this is obviously an industry that any country would want to be part of. Look at that very, very rapid growth in the 1990s. That's in terms of the actual power output of photovoltaic cells. When we look at the actual revenues, uh, we see again a very, very rapid growth, but discontinuous growth. Already there could be evidence that this will be a cyclical industry. If it's going to be a cyclical industry, then we know from prior experience with cyclical industries what kinds of strategies firms will have to follow to become players in this industry. So uh, is there a dominant technology? That's always the question that you have to start with if you're interested in using latecomer or fast follower strategies. And in this case, the answer is quite definitive. Yes, there is a dominant technology. It is crystalline silicon. So crystalline silicon is the dominant technology now. Now, there are a lot of 
niche technologies being developed, cadmium, tellurium, and many others. But the dominant technology is crystalline silicon. So that's where the fast followers like Taiwan would ex be expected to concentrate their efforts. So let's look at what they've been doing. Well, here we see the countries of East Asia again maneuvering to become the major players in this new industry. You see uh, Taiwan, China, um, can't read it, Japan, and Europe represented by Germany. So Germany is a player here. Notice that the United States is not even a player in this industry. Hmm? So, so the United States, not, not even a player as yet. But uh, the rest of the world, uh, still very, very small. But you know, this is an industry where Brazil should be getting very, very serious about becoming a player. So what, uh, what would we expect? Well, we, again, we would expect to find in this industry a similar kind of pattern of firms' entry. Large firms coming from Korea, in the form of Samsung and LG in particular, smaller firms from Taiwan, and indeed we find firms like Motec, Eton, Neosolar, Solatec, GET. Let me ask, how many people in the room have heard of any of those firms? Nobody. Nobody's heard of them. They're completely unknown firms. But they're the firms that are the players in this new industry in Taiwan. And then there's multinational linkage again. Uh, in Singapore, we see uh, the company Renewable Energy Corporation, a very, very large investment uh, in Singapore to produce uh, photovoltaic. So again, we would expect China to be utilizing all three of these models. So what is actually happening? Is there focus on the dominant technology on the part of these uh, countries, such as Taiwan? And you can see. Uh, the wafer fabrication using uh, crystalline silicon is far and away the most important value-adding activity going on in Taiwan today. So looking along the value chain, already Taiwan has established uh, companies in every part of the value chain, reading from the production of silicon itself to the wafer to the solar cell, the photovoltaic cell, its packaging into modules, and then the building of whole systems that can connect to the electricity power grid. Many firms are all along that value chain. But notice the difference. This time, China is not a follower. China is up there as a leader as well. So that whole value chain, China is already uh, a major player in every step of that value chain. So China has entered this industry very, very quickly and is already emerging as a major player. So when Brazilian firms look to enter this industry, they face a value chain that is already heavily populated by firms from Taiwan and China. So looking for the evidence at the level of individual firms, here's the value chain as seen by Etun, which is one of these new firms from Taiwan. And already they're a player, as you can see, in every step of the value chain. So it's not just the whole country which is a player across the value chain, but individual companies are also players in every step of the value chain. And uh, when we look at the role of the, uh, the state, the role of the Public Research Institute in the form of ITRI, again we see a characteristic pattern of ITRI building up patents in photovoltaic cells and then passing those patents across to the Taiwan companies as they enter. Again, we can expect to see that as a pattern in the case of China's entry into these in industries. So all along in this kind of description that I've been giving you of these, uh, of these fast follower or latecomer strategies in these three industries, and I've just chosen three, but I could, chose, I could choose 33 to illustrate these uh, We've used this concept of the latecomer, which comes from Alexander Geschenkron. And he, very, uh, in a very uh, famous article, uh, discussed uh, the rise of uh, 19th century latecomers in Europe, notably Germany and Russia, and discussed the kinds of institutional innovations that they had uh, engineered in order to catch up, to make up for their deficiencies. And the great uh, innovation in Germany was the creation of an industrial bank that was able to aggregate savings and channel savings towards the new industries. The new industries at the time were chemical and dyestuffs industries. And so Germany was able to drive investments towards that through the creation of the Deutsche Bank. Now we can see Brazil, India, and China doing the same thing in the field of renewable energies, which will be the great battleground for these kinds of uh, strategies in the 21st century.
So we see then how uh, latecomer advantages have been built and, uh, in, in East Asia, and numerous uh, authors from Akamatsu through Gashenkron and Schumpeter, Hirschman looking at his forward and backward linkages, Liebenstein with his ideas of collective entrepreneurship, and so on. Lots and lots of intellectual sources for understanding how these uh, latecomer strategies can be formulated and put into successful effect. But what I've shown you is these uh, industries all of which post-date uh, these authors, but you can see how the ideas apply uh, to these more recent industries. So the, the phrase that I use is to, to capture these, uh, these strategies is linkage, leverage, and learning. And I've shown you how the, the linkage occurs. Because of the multiply linked global economy, uh, firms are able to find sources of technology now much more easily than in the past. They don't have to do it all on their own. They can link up to advanced firms, they can license technologies from those firms, they can do contractual work for those firms and learn through that process. So they can link up, they can leverage knowledge from that and they can do it over and over again, uh, doing it more efficiently every time, which is a process of learning. Notice that those uh, concepts have no place in, again, standard mainstream economics. They all come from strategy, uh, that's, that's the field uh, within which one can make sense of these uh, latecomer practices. So a whole range of research uh, opened up here to look at industries from this perspective. And again, any PhD students in the room, I would strongly recommend uh, looking at these industries, particularly renewable energy industries, from this perspective of how firms are capturing latecomer advantages as they seek to enter the industries. So we can see in each of these uh, uh, East Asian experiences uh, the building of a national system of innovation where innovation, again I emphasize, doesn't mean uh, new products to the world but means industrial upgrading, catching up with the world leaders. And I've drawn there a whole series of institutions to do with technology capture, financial capture, uh, industrial, uh, industrial upgrading many of which are here in Brazil, in the agribusiness sector, for example, you have uh, public research institutes like Embrapa. So Embrapa is a world-class uh, public research institute driving the upgrading successes of the agribusiness sector. And it has its counterparts, you can see, in these institutions that were established uh, in the different uh, firms in, e in the different countries of East Asia. Always uh, the circle in the middle indicates that there is a pilot agency, a guidance system guiding the whole process, like the Economic Development Board in Singapore or the Economic Planning Board uh, in Korea. And now, of course, in China, the National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC, is the pilot agency guiding investments in the new industries in China. Let, just a word on the way in which we move from, uh, from fast followership to genuine innovation as measured by patents. And here we can uh, use the concept of the national innovative capacity. And uh, that's a way in which we can capture the idea of uh, all of these countries moving to become innovators in their own right. So uh, if we use this concept, uh, we can then look at the patenting records and we can see how on the left, uh, the US, Japan, Germany dominate uh, the processes of patenting. This is measuring patents at the US patent office. But notice these countries from East Asia uh, particularly Taiwan, rapidly becoming major players in the whole patenting game. Taiwan even outranking Korea in the, the number of patents that it's been uh, generating. This chart goes up to 2001. If you take the chart further up to 2006 or 2007, the pattern is even more striking. Notice that in this chart, China doesn't register. So up until 2001, the level of patenting in China was almost negligible. Now let's look at what's happened. Since 2001, when China entered the WTO, the rate of patenting has soared. So China is now a major player and it's building a national innovative capacity in terms of patenting. So again, the lesson is clear. Any country that wants to compete with China, and I imagine Brazil wants to do so in industry after industry, then you have to start getting active on the patenting front. You have to be able to match China and the other countries, of course, in terms of their patenting activities, both at the USPTO, the EPO, the Japan Patent Office, as well as in your own national patent office. Uh, and uh, 
the, uh, the analysis that uh, people in Taiwan are doing now of uh, this process is to look at patenting as a source of data, but to look at it uh, in terms of its depth and richness. So they're looking at backward and forward linkages, for example, the citation analysis of patents, which reveals to you the flow of knowledge from one country to another. So are patents in Taiwan citing US sources or Japanese sources or Korean sources? And that question can be answered by looking at the knowledge flows, that is the citations uh, in these patent flows. And my PhD student, Mei Chi Hu, in Taiwan has been doing uh, precisely that kind of analysis. So what lies behind China's success is the big question, the question that animates the discussions at this conference. And uh, the point is that uh, behind China's success lies a whole range, a whole raft of institutional innovations combined with company level innovations that draw from the prior successes of Korea, Japan and Taiwan. And, and now we now see them being uh, practiced and replicated in China. And that whole pattern of institutions uh, clearly uh, provides a different point of reference from the one that uh, we've all been familiar with in the past, the Washington Consensus that has dominated development thinking. The kind of strategies that I've just been illustrating to you, strategies that have actually worked, strategies that are very, very practical and successful, have nothing to do with the Washington Consensus. In fact, they draw from a different set of ideas that for want of a better word, we might call a Beijing, Seoul, Tokyo consensus. Now, never, never mind the labels, that actually uh, stands for the best, best consensus for development, which is a rather nice acronym that Linda Weiss came up with first. But in fact, looking at the pattern there, uh, it's quite clearly different from the pattern that we find uh, in uh, the Washington consensus. So the significance is that countries uh, like China are departing from that uh, established consensus and other countries that want to do as well as China or want to compete with China would also have to depart from it. So what are the elements of that consensus? Um, and, you know, on the understanding that the Washington consensus is now dead, what, what is the consensus, uh, what is the kind of national pattern of institutions uh, that has driven China and now other uh, countries looking to emulate China uh, would be a different kind of pattern where the emphasis is on building institutions capable of capturing knowledge and diffusing knowledge and putting the knowledge to good work in the agents of modernization, the agents of industrialization, which are firms and public sector research state agencies. So the focus is on those two principal agents, building capable firms and building capable research institutions to support them and then making sure that there is a, a pattern of institutions which generates the knowledge, captures the knowledge from the rest of the world, diffuses that knowledge across as rapidly as possible and puts pressure on firms through tax systems, subsidies and other systems to keep industrially upgrading. This is what was done in Taiwan, this is what was done in Korea and this is what is now being done in China. So it creates an economic environment in which capability development not only will proceed, but will be forced to proceed. This is, not, this is not a nanny state. This is not a kindergarten. This is not a sandpit, a playground. This is a tough world where you succeed or you fail, where you upgrade or you're pushed out. It's a tough world where only the winners are allowed to uh, last. If we compare this with the Washington Consensus, uh, then we see the Washington Consensus is actually all about macroeconomic uh, ac macroeconomic management. We heard a lot about macroeconomic management yesterday. Uh, exchange rate control, uh, deficit control and so on. It's obviously important but it's not the key to success in the way in which firms and countries become players in these new knowledge intensive industries like photovoltaics. Um, so uh, the the emphasis of the Washington Consensus was, was all on these macroeconomic issues, but it missed the point that the real driver of success in China as elsewhere has been on building these systems uh, that are based on knowledge and the diffusion of knowledge and the pressure on upgrading. So, summarizing uh, the argument that I've developed so far is that uh, industrial upgrading is by far the hardest thing that any country will ever address.
So if anybody tries to pretend in this room that uh, Brazil faces an easy task in terms of emulating these strategies, the answer is that it's not. It's a very, it's, this is an extraordinarily difficult process. And uh, we see in the 19th century, uh, countries did succeed in upgrading and catching up. In the 20th century, uh, the, uh, Japan and the Four Tigers were able to succeed. And now in the 21st century, the ball is at the feet of the large countries that represent half the world's population, Brazil, China, and India. Will they be able to utilize the lessons from the past and uh, be able to uh, frame strategies uh, to capture these latecomer effects. I'm saying that the 21st century will actually turn on the issue of renewable energies. And I have a few slides on energy, but I think perhaps uh, I've used up sufficient time and I might uh, show some of these slides during uh, a question and answer session if, if you like. But I'll leave it, I'll leave it there with that, with that summary of the argument. Dando prosseguimento. Dando prosseguimento, estamos convidando o Robert Wade para a mesa. Robert Wade, Robert Wade é professor da London School of Economics, de Economia Política. É, tem uma longa carreira, uma passagem pelo Banco Mundial e outras características. E o que ele não sabe é que esta casa, esse instituto... É, é consumidor do seu livro clássico, Governing the Market, desde que ele surgiu. Este é um livro que cai em prova. Este é um livro, ele não está acompanhando, mas o livro do Wade, Governing the Market, foi desde há muito tempo adotado aqui nos cursos de pós-graduação como uma referência básica. É um livro sobre Taiwan. Robert Wade. I join John in thanking um, the organizers of this conference um, for the invitation. Um, the organizers of this conference, uh, Anna Cecilia and uh, Antonio, seem to me, and I think seem to John and Linda, to be larger than life people larger than life, just as this city, Rio, seems to be a larger than life city. Um, I'm going to talk about the global crisis, although you may not know in Brazil that there is a global crisis. Um, however, I want to begin by t two quick comments on what you have just heard. John declared towards the end of his talk that the Washington Consensus is dead. And I recommend to any professors of political economy in the room, Anna Celia, Antonio, and others, that a very good exam question is, is the Washington Consensus dead? Question um, mark. John says yes. Um, and I know in what sense he says yes. He says it's empirically refuted. But I say it is not dead. It is a zombie idea. <laughs> a zombie is an animal which is uh, killed but immediately rises up again and you kill it, it rises up yet again. It refuses to die. The Washington Consensus is such an idea. The World Bank is still very much pushing Washington Consensus ideas. It is not at all pushing the kinds of arguments that John was advancing, and I think that is an absolute scandal, but it is true, it is not. Um, I did research in Taiwan in a very similar vein, as Antonio said, in the early 1980s. I remember once I had an interview with a man named K.T. Lee, K.T. Lee, L.I., who was the Minister of Science and Technology. And when I went into his office, he was just clearing up from a meeting with other colleagues. And at this meeting, they had been studying an input-output table of the IC, the Integrated Circuit Industry, in Taiwan. They had a map in front of them 
and they were looking at all the places in the input-output table where it might be possible to substitute for imports because on this map they had not only the value chain links but they also had where the imports were coming in the chain and where, where domestic production was coming. Now they were talking as everybody was talking at that time of import substitution but I recommend and again for students and professors here that you never talk about import substitution because in Washington consensus circles and in economics departments around the world if you use the phrase import substitution you are automatically excluded from further serious consideration because everybody knows import substitution is by definition bad therefore when you want to talk about import substitution use the phrase import replacement <laughs> because nobody knows the phrase import replacement and therefore it does not have an automatic negative connotation my final point has to do with something that I, uh, struck me about yesterday afternoon's session with the entrepreneurs what struck me was how little attention they gave or no attention they gave to any sort of links with the state other than perhaps BNPS the development bank but other than that they presented themselves as entirely um, self-directed no help from the state what struck me about that was that when I did my research in Taiwan the Taiwan entrepreneurs gave the same impression to me no help from the state when I tried to talk to them about their links the help they got from ITRI the Industrial Technology Research Institute that John talked about or the Electronics Research Service Organization called ERSO when I tried to talk to them about these links they said no 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 we don't have any help those people are incompetent they're corrupt and so on and so on yet it turned out that these people were in recurrent contracts recurrent contact with these organizations that they said were useless um, and as John's evidence shows these public organizations did give a great deal of help to Taiwan entrepreneurs but the significance of what I'm saying this contrast between what the entrepreneurs told me and what I knew to be the case was that Taiwan economists and visiting economists except me they all believed what the entrepreneurs said they all believed that the state gave them no help and that Taiwan was a model of free market entrepreneurs operating in efficient markets without help from the state and of course there was a political interest in them saying this the government officials did not want the Americans to believe that the Taiwan state was giving help to Taiwan industry because otherwise the Americans might say that's unfair competition we're going to put on tariffs on your products so there were distinct interests behind this strategy of denying that the state was being helpful to them but from the point of view of one who is trying to understand the catch-up process including in Brazil it's extremely important to study these uh, links between the entrepreneurs and the state okay so those are my comments on uh, on what uh, the, on the subject John was talking about now I want to talk about the crisis especially in the core of the world economy North America Europe Japan the big the first big point is that um, 2009 will probably be the first year since the Second World War in which global GDP has fallen it will probably be point number one point number two until perhaps a month ago or two months ago there was still serious talk of us that is in the core going into another great depression a second great depression 
And it is true that in the fourth quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009, production and employment in the US were falling at as fast a rate as in the, uh, as in the Great Depression. Production and employment were falling as fast as they fell in the first years of the Great Depression in the United States. It is now pretty clear that we are not going to have a second Great Depression, though on the other hand, by most measures, it is the most serious uh, recession since the Second World War. And I will just give a few uh, measures to substantiate the two points I've just made. It's not the Great Depression, but it is the worst since the Second World War. First of all, in t terms of the duration, the length of time of contraction of GDP in the US. Well, in the Great Depression, the contraction from August 1929 to March 1933 was 43 months, 43 months. This one is likely to be, this is the consensus forecast, between 20, the contraction, between 20 and 25 months, starting in December 2007. So there's a big difference between a contraction of 20, 25 months and a contraction of 43 months. And by the way, in 1973-74, and again in 1981-82, the worst previous recession since the Second World War, the duration of the contraction was 16 months. So 16, this one will be worse. It'll be 20, 25 months, but nothing like the Great Depression. Secondly, in terms of the contraction of GDP, the percentage points of contraction from peak to trough, in the Great Depression in the US, that contraction was 27%, 27%. This one in the US will probably be about 3%, so nothing like as bad. Again. The, in terms of the, another measure, the percentage increase in unemployment, um, it's likely again that the percentage increase in unemployment in the US and in quite a bit of the West will be bigger than any increase since the Second World War, but again, nothing like it was in the Great Depression. So, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the fact that we're not going to have a Great Depression um, and the fact that there are some signs of recovery has meant that some people are declaring that the recession is almost over. It's going to be over much sooner than we thought that we are well up on the second leg of a V-shaped recovery. The V went down in the... Uh, fourth quarter of 2008, first quarter of 2009, and after March, it has turned around and we are well up on the second leg of the V, and pretty soon we will be back to business as usual. Well, let me make some comments about this very now quite common argument. First of all, I think that the global economy will probably grow by more in the third quarter and fourth quarter of this year than was expected even just a few weeks ago. So in terms of just growth, the news in the last few weeks has been fairly good. The second point is that this recovery that we are probably experiencing is not robust. It's not sustainable in the sense of a V. Um, and the reason is, at least one of the reasons is, that this recovery is being artificially stimulated by the biggest stimulus, fiscal monetary stimulus, that the world has ever seen. Um, trillions of dollars 
uh, have been pumped in by governments and central banks uh, to the global economy in a way that was not true in the Great Depression. That's the big difference between this recession and the Great Depression. This time, governments, central banks have really pumped in a great deal of fiscal and monetary stimulus. But I think that the outlook in the next few years is going to be uh, um, a, a W-shaped recovery, W, not a V. Um, uh, uh, there will be, as I said, a recovery in the third quarter and fourth quarter of this year. Be why? Because inventories are being restocked. Inventories fell to very, very low levels. They're being restocked. But the problem is that um, the stimulus packages are coming to an end. They have to come to an end. They're, they're way too big to be sustained. Unemployment is still going up very fast. And so I think it's quite likely that we will have another recession in 2010. That will be the second, that the downward part of the W, the W going down again, and then round about the end of 2010, early 2011, we will have in the West a return to quite slow uh, but positive um, rates of growth. Um, slow because uh, gigantic leverage, gigantic levels of debt have to be worked out and also gigantic global imbalances between the surplus countries and the deficit countries also have to be um, worked out and that working out of the of leverage of debt and global imbalances is going to be very slow it's going to be very painful it's also going to be very conflictful between countries the basic problem in terms of reducing global imbalances is that Europe especially Germany um, also Japan also China very much China they are all likely to continue with broadly the same policies as they have been pursuing, um, hoping to resume their economic growth through increases in exports rather than through boosting domestic demand or certainly with a heavy emphasis on restoring the old growth model which had an export growth as a very important component and there's a good reason for this because boosting domestic demand turns out to be actually a pretty difficult thing to do especially for countries with a long history of debt fueled consumption that is of consumption fueled by debt such as the US and such as um, uh, the UK and in China, there are big political obstacles to um, increasing domestic consumption in um, particular, as I'll come back to, um, private consumption and private incomes in China are growing very slowly and the stimulus package is oriented mostly to um, infrastructure and to state-owned enterprises generating profits and the government is trying to increase exports by giving tax rebates. The problem is that they're, going, they're looking for export markets that don't exist. The US consumers are having to uh, restrain their consumption, not increase uh, from China. Um, so you get this great tension. The US, uh, the UK, the other big deficit countries are trying to cut back their deficits, reduce their imports, at the same time as all these big surplus countries, Japan, China, J Germany, are trying to increase their exports. So there's a real um, tension um, building up. And I think that the resolution of these imbalances will come in the form of very low rates of economic growth, global economic growth, over the next um, several years as this enormous misallocation of capital that has gone on now for some years in the form of these asset bubbles as this misallocation is worked out of the system.
So I've just given a summary of my um, prospects for the world economy, a W-shaped recovery with several years of slow economic growth ahead. Um, I want to now just give you some um, evidence to substantiate the point that this recovery is not robust, it's not sustainable. In terms, for example, of the real economy, the productive economy, one leading indicator of recovery of the state of an economy is advertising. And advertising in the US, in the UK, and much of Western Europe is just flat, um, like a patient suffering from cardiac arrest, suffering from a heart attack, the heart has stopped beating, advertising budgets have stopped growing. That's a good indicator uh, of great uncertainty on the part of firms. Um, corporate investment has collapsed. It's collapsed dramatically in the UK, the biggest collapse of corporate investment since the Second World War. Um, consumer spending is flat. Uh, US consumer spending equals 70% of GDP, 70, 70% of GDP. US consumers are really cutting back and trying to rebuild their household balance sheets. The housing market, yes, prices are not falling in the way they were, but um, while prices uh, over much of the core of the world economy have kind of stabilized, um, housing transactions are way down, and that means uh, that um, as uh, uh, unemployment rises, um, house repossessions, repossessions are going up, and um, banks have on their books a lot of very bad loans linked to housing that they can't get rid of. So there's an iteration between the state of the housing market and the state of financial markets. Until the housing market recovers, the financial markets won't recover. That's in, those are some indicators about the real economy, in, especially in the US, Ireland, uh, Britain, Iceland. I've been spending time in Iceland where the crisis is really extreme. Um, also, the fiscal economy. Um, as I suggested, um, the stimulus, the recovery of economic growth has come very largely from the higher levels of government spending, not from consumers, not from firms. Um, but this government spending, this very high level of government spending is simply not sustainable. The US federal deficit is now running at the level of 11%. 11% of GDP, um, and this stimulus package is going to end fairly soon. But not just the stimulus package, also the unemployment benefits for, for people who were in the first generation of those made unemployed. Those unemployment benefits are going to end, and so those people will suffer a further big fall in their um, incomes. In terms of the, that's the fiscal economy. In terms of the financial economy, this is, this is really important. Um, it, it's quite clear that for all the talk of the recovery of economic growth, many sound companies, many healthy companies cannot get credit. And the reason is that um, central banks in Europe and the US are pouring dizzying amounts. Can you translate dizzying? It makes you dizzy. The amounts are so big. Dizzying amounts of money into the money markets and politicians are putting pressure on banks to lend this money. So the banks are getting almost free money. They're paying almost nothing for the money that they're getting and they, they are meant to be investing this money in the real economy. The problem is the banks are under contradictory instructions from the, the government, from the central banks. 
One is you must increase lending to businesses. And the second one is you must rebuild your capital and your profits. And it turns out that the two things do not go together. They are contradictory. Um, and in fact, what the banks are doing is that they are investing, quote unquote, in government bonds, which are very safe, in the stock market, and in the property market. I'm talking now of the US and Britain and Ireland and such places. For example, the, in terms of the stock market, there's a, there's a waterfall, there's an avalanche of money going into the stock market such that the S&P 500 is again far above um, the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio. It's a bubble that w is building up in the stock market yet again. In terms of property, it's estimated for the UK that three quarters, three quarters of the bailout money that went to the banks and the UK government spent a huge amount of money bailing out the banks, three quarters of this money the banks have invested in, not in businesses, but in property. They've been helping landlords rather than helping um, businesses to build up their working uh, capital. So this is like, what's happening is, is like a plumber who is trying to force water through a domestic water supply system in which many of the pipes are blocked up or they're even broken. Some of the water that the central banks are pushing into the pipes, some of it is getting through to consumers and to firms, but a great deal of it is going somewhere um, else. And in terms of what is getting to, through to firms, it's getting through mainly to the big, the reputable firms and not to the small and medium um, enterprises. And then again, as I suggested, much of the rest that's not going to the big reputable companies is going into the stock market and into um, property. And by the way, one uh, form of investment in the stock market is in future contracts for oil, energy, and food. And we are now seeing a, an enormous speculative demand for these commodities. Um, these commodities are being driven up in price because of speculative demand, which is coming from this enormous supply of money that the central banks are pumping into the banking system and which the banks are not lending to businesses. They're buying futures contracts. Uh, so, and this um, is another reason, another very important reason, why the recovery is not sustainable, because we will probably see in the next six months big increases in the prices of oil, energy, and food, and that's going to be a big demand shock. So in the financial economy, in other words, we are in what Keynes called the liquidity trap, or what he referred to as pushing on a piece of string. You can push on the piece of string, but the other end doesn't move. That's the situation that we are in. And let me just mention, mention something else. I was really surprised to see these figures. They are about US banks. There is a ratings agency which rates US banks. And um, this agency has recently pu published a report um, and this report shows the p percentage change in the number of US banks that were listed as sound or as failing banks in March to June of this year. So we're talking very, very recently. What's the, this, what surprised me was that the number of, even in March to June of this year, the number of financially sound U.S. banks is falling. I mean, and it's falling very much. It fell, the number of financially sound U.S. banks fell by 21% between March and June, and the number of banks giving, given a failing grade, I mean, 
very unsound, that rose by 17% between March and June of this year. So the point is that the US financial system, the US financial system, take out the, the big money center banks that have got these huge bailouts, ignore them. The US banking system as a whole is in very bad shape and is deteriorating. That's, that's the surprising point. I've been talking about financial and economic matters, but there's a very important phenomenon that we're now seeing in a big way, and that is the, the feedback from the economic and the financial to the social, to what is happening in households, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in condition of unemployment with their house mortgages now worth more than their houses are worth, many households facing repossession of their houses. Um, and at the same time, as uh, millions of more people are needing state help, the budgets of state agencies are being cut and taxes are being raised. And the taxes being raised are very regressive, not progressive, but regressive taxes. So this combination is a deadly combination. Um, and it, it has operated with a lag. It has taken some time for these spillover effects to come through, but we're now seeing under the impetus of rising unemployment, falling wages, um, also, by the way, falling pensions, because many pensioners have been very badly hit by this crisis too, um, and for cuts in state spending, increases in taxes, under the impact of all these things, we're seeing thing, uh, uh, rising rates in Britain, for example, rising rates of, of family breakdown, of abuse of children, of alcoholism, of uh, teenage delinquency. All these things are going up, um, causing problems which social agencies then have to deal with at the same time as their budgets are cut. And just another example, the, the public education system in Britain is suffering too. Why? Because many households that were sending their children to private schools have pulled their children out of private schools and are now trying to get them into the public system. So the public system is under very heavy pressure as its budgets are being cut. And then, of course, this, the crisis goes also from uh, the, uh, from the economic and financial, not just to the social, but also to the political. Because obviously people affected in these kind of ways uh, generally don't just remain passive. They, in one way or another, um, react or they are available to be mobilized by politicians to, to try and um, defend themselves. In Iceland, for example, we had um, the government fall after months of protests. Um, every, uh, ev every Saturday uh, afternoon, thousands of people gathered in the main square of uh, Reykjavik. Every Monday, 2,000 people gathered in the big theater in Reykjavik. Um, week after week after week, these protests went on. Finally, the government fell, um, and other governments have fallen. The Japanese change in government is clearly related to this crisis, um, uh, people are exercising their democratic right to, as they say, throw the rascals out, throw the people out who got them into this mess. Let me talk something now about China, specifically about China. Um, China did not experience a financial crisis did not experience a financial crisis, but it has been very hard hit by second round effects coming through the export channel, basically through the collapse of US demand for China's um, exports. And it was because things got really bad in China in uh, the, the last quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009, like 20 million people were sacked from their job, 20 million people. 
in, the, um, in Guangdong province, in one province alone. It was because the uh, shock to China was really very bad and the government was very frightened about mass unrest, not just in the eastern seaboard, but also going out into the far west with the Uyghurs and others, um, that it amounted this enormous stimulus package, the like of which the world has never seen um, before. And in a way, this stimulus package worked in the sense that on the surface, China is leading the world to recovery. China is likely to have 8% growth of GDP in 2009, 8%. But this is very misleading. And the basic point can be made by saying that sometimes it's much better to grow at 5% than to grow at 8%. Um, you can see what just how extraordinary the situation in China has been in the past year from the growth figures quarter by quarter. In the last uh, quarter of 2008, Chinese GDP growth was zero, zero. In the first quarter of 2009, it was 3%. And in the second quarter of 2009, the quarter that's just ended, the estimates are it was 16%. Can you imagine that? 16% uh, rate of growth. And that was because of this enormous uh, stimulus package, uh, fiscal stimulus together with new bank lending, which was ordered by the government. The fiscal stimulus alone in China equals about 14%, 1,4% of GDP, of 2008 GDP. 14% of 2008 GDP is the size of the current fiscal stimulus. And in terms of new bank lending, this is the biggest increase in bank lending that the world has ever seen. The increase in bank lending in the first half of 2009 was three times the increase in bank lending in 2008. Three times. And um, just new bank lending alone in 2009 equaled 45% of GDP in the first half of 2009. So almost half of China's GDP in 2009 was equal to the size of the new bank lending that the government ordered. Um, well, there, there are no prizes for guessing that there might be a great deal of misallocation in this enormous increase in uh, lending. Um, there are no prizes for guessing that there might, it might be, much of it might be a very low quality. Um, it's estimated that about 50% of the new bank lending, despite what the want government wanted, but actually speaking, 50% went into either the stock market or into property. There's no doubt that um, China uh, has had this year an enormous stock market bubble, which is probably now beginning to go down. The problem is the second bubble is not going down. That is the property bubble. And the property bubble is much, much more dangerous than the stock market bubble. But if you look at things like um, rents relative to house prices, rents are static, but house prices are, are soaring up, meaning that prices are going up not because uh, there's increasing demand for people to live in the houses, but because there's speculative demand um, record prices are being paid for land, another index of um, uh, rampant property um, speculation. The, this bubble is going to burst. Uh, the problem is that property bubbles are um, much harder to uh, un recover from and they take much longer to recover from. I was in Shanghai uh, two, two or three weeks ago, 
And I began to get a very uh, uneasy feeling that it was like when I was talking to Chinese economists, it was like I was in Bangkok in 1995, 96, and the first half of 97. Uh, or it was like I was in Reykjavik, Iceland, in 2004, 2005, 2006. In both places, there was a collective denial that um, there, there was a major uh, problem coming up. And I found the same thing amongst the three groups of economists that I talked to in Shanghai. Um, there was a sense that this somehow or other uh, could be continued. Um, it won't be continued. Um, Chinese banks are building up huge non-performing loans. So um, the relevance of, of this, uh, I haven't quite finished uh, what I'm going to say, but just in case you're wondering where the, all this is going, the relevance of it is that if, if countries like Brazil are counting on continued fast growth in China, this seems to me a really dangerous strategy. I said that about half of the increase in new bank lending has gone to stock markets and property, but the other half has gone mainly to infrastructure, enormous infrastructure increase in what they call the iron uh, triangle, the iron triangle, which means railways, roads, and airports. Huge overbuilding, especially of airports, going on in China. It'll take It'll take many, many decades to get money back from these investments. The other uh, use of this new bank lending is for the state-owned enterprises. Very little has gone to small and medium enterprises. But the state-owned enterprises um, uh, have got a great deal of it. And what we're seeing in China now is, is very paradoxical. Despite all the government's talk about free market reforms, liberalizing markets, what is actually happening on the ground in response to the crisis is the opposite. That is, there is renationalization taking place. The state-owned enterprises that are now on the commanding heights of the service sectors of the economy, such as transport, such as banking, such as logistics, such as media, uh, and I'm sure there are others, the state-owned enterprises that control these industries are getting more and more powerful, and they are using their easy access to credit now due, due to the crisis, they're using that to buy up, this is the key point, to buy up private firms, private Chinese firms, to buy up small and medium enterprises. So they are growing by acquisitions the state-owned enterprises are. So we're not seeing a process that you might expect of a decline in the state-owned enterprise sector. On the contrary, the state-owned enterprise sector is becoming more powerful than it was before. They're building up stronger monopolistic positions. On the other hand, not, there is not much spending going on to build stronger social security networks, to build up pension systems, to build up medical insurance systems. I mean, there is some, but there's not a great deal. And the reason why that is so important, the lack of spending in building social security systems, the reasons why that is so important is because that is a necessary condition for increasing consumption, therefore for increasing domestic demand, therefore for redu reducing the pressure to export. Um, as I said, the government is doing just the opposite. The government is giving tax rebates to exporters. It's trying to restart the old export growth um, model. And not only is the government not uh, increasing spending on social protection, but also wages in China remain very low in the sense that Chinese wages are an extremely low share of GDP relative to other countries and wages have been falling as a share of GDP. Um, it's one of the lowest shares, wages to GDP is one of the lowest shares in 
the world and also, of course, the share of consumption in GDP is one of the lowest in the world. So, just to wrap up, China has three really big problems in its current strategy. One of them is that the stimulus package is blowing up a gigantic property bubble which will burst. Um, the second one is that the stimulus package and the new loans are blowing up what you could call an infrastructure bubble that is way uh, e excessively fast investment in certain kinds of infrastructure, increasing excess capacity, increasing waste. And the third big problem with the current strategy in China is, as I've said, that it's trying to reestablish the export-led growth model. But the question is, where are the exports going to? They can't go to the US, at least not on any size. What about Brazil? Is Brazil going to um, accept a big surge of uh, Chinese manufactured imports, which are subsidized by the Chinese state through tax rebate, re rebates? I would suspect not, but that's what the Chinese strategy um, uh, requires. So the Chinese recovery strategy is not helping global recovery. It's not helping to reduce global imbalances. And China itself may suffer the fate of East Asia in 1997, 98. And then, of course, quite apart from all these economic things I've been talking about, there are the political effects in China of households uh, not sharing in the growth of profits, uh, of wages b continuing to be kept very low, and of the social, uh, the state-owned enterprise sector becoming even bigger and taking over private firms. This will have political effects. The Chinese government is extremely worried, as you know, about social instability. So the government will be acting in one way or another to stop these political effects becoming manifest as a form of protest. You can imagine how the Chinese government may go about doing that. So I, in many ways, am an optimist about China, certainly in the long run. But I think it's time to start worrying about China in the next five to 10 years. Its macro strategy is increasing global imbalances and its macro strategy may be bad for China itself. And therefore, I think, as a, just to repeat the main point, it's very foolish for commodity exporters like Brazil to uh, assume that China's recovery, this 8% figure, will just go on and on and on. I think that that's um, rather unlikely. Um, I could uh, say something now about a whole agenda of international action that the G20, including Brazil, uh, should be pushing for, should be pushing for. But I think um, uh, I will end at this point. But we can um, pick up these more international questions about the WTO, about the Financial, Service, uh, the, um, Financial Stability Board, which has come out of the Financial Stability Forum, and which is a kind of global financial regulator, or which pretends to be a, gl a, a global financial um, regulator. Uh, and Brazil, of course, is involved in that. Um, we can talk about these issues in the discussion if you wish. However, one final point is that I have put over there a number of copies of a recent short paper of mine which gives a kind of overview of s some of the points I've been making about the, the causes of the crisis and also about national and international policy responses to the crisis. Thank you.